having us here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Brenda Berg. I'm the president and CEO of Best NC, Business for Educational Success and Transformation in North Carolina. We represent over 140 business leaders who are deeply committed to education here in North Carolina. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about principal pay because of course leadership is an incredibly important factor here. Um, Dr. Tozer, Dr. Baxter, I mean, you both knocked out of the park in terms of opening. And a lot of our work and our research has been found about their work and their research, as well as a lot of input from Dr. Fritz. I'm really proud to be among such great company today. Um, we, uh, like Dr. Baxter we, uh, and Dr. Tozer, like to begin with the end. And the end is student achievement. So we're not here just to talk about adults and how we pay adults. But we're here to talk about how paying adults can improve student achievement. Um, Dr. Tozer's results are phenomenal, extraordinary work in closing the achievement gaps, and ultimately that is what this is all about. And in North Carolina, we have sizable gaps. This is just one example. 40% of North Carolina students fail to meet the UNC minimum for uh, ACT college and career readiness. That's an unacceptable uh, level. They can hear back on the back. Okay. Keep talking right there. Okay. Yeah. So, students, <clears throat> so leadership matters. From a business perspective, we know leadership matters. But you just walk into any school, you walk into the highest performing, high growth schools here in North Carolina. I don't care if it's a traditional, magnet, charter, private, whatever that school is, it doesn't really matter. You will find one thing that they have in common, and it's an extraordinary principle. Is leading that school. Data says that 25% of the school's impact on student achievement, direct impact on student achievement, is from the principal. I would beg to argue it's significantly more than that because the indirect impact is that we know that the teachers don't want to work for that leader and they will leave. And so that 60 plus percent impact that teachers have on student achievement really directly relates to having a great leader in the school. Um, so I would argue that's somewhere closer to almost full impact. Really, if you don't have a great leader, you won't have an exceptionally performing school. So we see sort of a, a Venn diagram of cha challenges. I think we all can agree that there are challenges with the current system um, of how we pay our principals. The first is adequacy. The second is competitiveness. And the third is structure. You've had testimony from others who go into some of these details, so I just want to cover a couple of them really quickly. Adequacy matters. Uh, we can see that there has been a real value decline in principal and assistant principal pay over the, the last decade plus. Um, and while Dr. Tozer shows a big gap between principal pay and teacher pay in Illinois, we don't have as much of that gap. We are currently the second of the lowest principal payers in the country. Um, our assistant principals oftentimes are making as much as they would as a teacher. So there is not that big gap. I would also argue that pay may not be an incentive, but it's a disincentive. And as Dr. Tozer even said just now, if we don't pay more, you won't pull them into that pipeline. So pay does matter, and when you're currently 50th in the nation in that pay, adequacy does matter. And I really appreciate Senator Tillman, Representative Blackwell, you both said we are not adequately funding principal pay and we need to increase it. So we're looking forward to seeing what you're coming back with. The second is competitiveness. Dr. Tozer mentioned wide variations in North Carolina. And I know this is a really small chart I'm happy to provide it to you. But these are the wide variations. We have local salary supplements as little as zero. And we have some that are higher than $27,000 on average per principal. And you take Wake County, Franklin County, that are right next to each other, Franklin County has a 20 point higher poverty level. They have more need for great principals, and yet there's a $22,000 pay gap between those, those two districts. You can compare Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and, and Cabarrus, which actually have poverty levels that are fairly similar, and again, it's a $14,000 $14, pay gap. So there's a, there's a challenge here with competitiveness. And third, the structure of our schedule. 
is providing disincentives where we really need incentives. Uh, a good example that concerns me is if you have a great principal in an elementary school, let's say there are a thousand kids in that school, it's a big elementary school, it's a high, it's a Title I, lots of bilingual uh, population, and they're knocking it out of the park. They will always get paid more to move to a bigger school, even if that bigger school does not have those challenges. And frankly, even if that principal is not as well suited for that bigger school. So why wouldn't we pay that principal who is doing great things for the students who need it most? Why aren't we paying to keep them where they're needed most? But the, the current schedule doesn't allow for that. It also, um, as we know, there are all sorts of incentives to move from school to school given the current schedule. And that's partially why we are the fifth worst in the nation in turning over our principals from school, moving from school to school. And that's at the average. The average principal is moving every 2.7 to 3.2 years. Now that's the average. You talk about a high challenge school, you're seeing principals turn over every year, every two years. Imagine going into that school that has a high need, name the need, and try to transform that in a year or two in a sustainable way so that when you leave, any gains that you have would continue. It doesn't make sense. And our current st structure just doesn't support that. So as you look at compensation priorities, I ask that you look at three things. One is, how does it affect how you recruit your principals? How does it affect how you incentivize your principals? And how can it increase retention, not just overall retention, not just retention of anyone, but how can it improve how we retain principles where they can have their greatest impact? So Dr. Baxter said, I think it's maybe clearer than mud, the research on how to pay principles best, but there is no blueprint for how we can do this. And that's true. So I think part of why Gus has been asked to come here is to share some business perspectives. Regardless of the industry, if you want to attract and motivate great talent, compensation must align with that philosophy. We believe that. We also believe that leadership matters. And so the combination is why we're here today. So I'm going to walk you through some results. We actually surveyed more than two dozen large, successful employers in the state of North Carolina. The average companies had more than 5,000 employees, and so they looked like the size of a medium-sized district, medium to sort of well, medium-sized district here in North Carolina. And we asked them to think about their executives who have 50 to 200 employees in their responsibility, maybe have a budget of five to $20 million. Think about those employees. They're not necessarily the CEO, right? But what is their executive position? They typically refer to them as senior vice presidents or directors in their organization. And we ask them to think about how they compensate those high-level executives. And here's what came back. It's basically what you would expect, right? Everyone gets a base salary of some sort. Almost every single employer reported a base perform a performance opportunity on top of that that's not guaranteed that is tied to performance. And then benefits vary, health insurance, retirement, other, um, Dr. Baxter referred to autonomy. There are all sorts of benefits that you can put into a package beyond that. What I found interesting is when we asked them, who <coughs> decides, right? We had the superintendents testify the other day, and they said, this is difficult. How are we going to decide? Well, it's not one person deciding. Within a large organization, the person who decides compensation is usually that person's boss. So in the case of a principal, it would be the superintendent. But they decided within the parameters of what the human resource office would uh, determine or a compensation committee if there were a board. So it's not something that's done willy-nilly. It's not something that's done just by one person, but it's done in combination. So what we found is that um, in the comment section under the combination, it was typically your direct report and then within parameters. Base pay, when we asked about base pay, almost, well, 80% reported 
that base K was done within a band. So even base K has a band. It's not strictly we're going to pay you this based on this schedule or, and it's certainly not a repair fee that said we're just going to have no maximum, no minimum, you can pay them whatever you want from your, from your budget. Um, what they did say was that the band was set by the market. Like, what will the market hold? So if you're talking about a highly challenged elementary school, what is the market for that? You want to look at bands for that situation that that principal will be going into, which speaks to having some more information and better data about what is that competitive pay going to look like. When it came to bonuses, um, it was a wide range. You can see that about um, more than 75% of the pie was zero to 30%, obviously not zero, because these are people who have performance bonuses, but no more than 30% on top of the base pay. So we're not talking about bonuses that are 45, 50% on top of it, but we're also not talking about something that's as small as one or 2%. You're typically seeing in this 20, 11 to 20% range uh, that you have that opportunity to gain that much more income based on your performance. Now, what is that determined by? So with these employers, they reported it's individual performance, group or company performance, financial targets were the top three. Equating that to a principal shift would be, how are you doing as a principal? What, what's the feedback on your performance evaluation? What is your retention rate? your teachers how are you doing as a leader performance measures we would recommend looking at growth student growth measures um, and frankly when you're talking about profit right in, in the private sector you're talking about growth in education that's the money right that's what we're trying to go for that's what we're, we're trying to accomplish so lessons from education look very similar <coughs> Dr. Baxter pointed out that it's kind of, there's not a lot of research in here, but the research lessons that we have learned on education innovations for principal pay have also used similar performance targets, student growth, performance evaluations. They mentioned demand for positions. So if someone's not, if you're not getting a demand for a rural position or a high poverty position, that that could come into the performance package. In the private sector, that looks more like demands. So that's something to pay attention to. Just because it's being done, you might, because we are looking at North Carolina to be the first in the nation to do this on this scale, might want to consider that dem dem demand for the position to go into the bands and not into the performance um, component. So to our recommendations, I'm actually going to start with one that's not on the list. Um, because I think both of our previous speakers alluded to it, we need more data. Uh, North Carolina has the data, we can pull the data. Let's look at who we're paying, how we're paying them, what the turnovers are, uh, what their performance looks like, how is the system currently working now, and what results are we seeing. I think more data would be very helpful. But our first official recommendation is the salary increase. We, we need more, more um, pay for our, our principals. We can't be 50 of them in the nation. We will not keep and, and attract great principals without that. If we can't do that in one year, I think what you did last year for teacher pay, where you put in a multi-year commitment, that kind of um, two, three-year plan would be fantastic. Second, we recommend that you somehow link principal pay with teacher pay. This is not sort of a business way of doing it. This is just common practical sense, and I'll tell you why. As we have been advocating for principal pay over the last couple of years, when I talk to a principal and say, yes, we're, you need a raise, you haven't had one in nine years, or 1.2% in nine years, and, and they say, oh, don't, don't, don't. I get, give it to the teachers. Um, and so why do you think we have time because our principals are really focused on the teachers and getting them raises. I really do believe that the, the rising tide should lift all boats. If we're going to give raises for teachers, the best way to do it is somehow tied to the principal pay, not necessarily just for the individuals, but making sure that that pot of money is also going up 
because as much as we love our principals, they're working really hard. I have to be honest, they, they, they're a small group, there are 2,500 of them, and they're not going to keep fighting to keep all these things going on. So that's one very practical reason to tie the two together. Um, another example is, as we saw um, a couple of years ago with the significant increases in teacher pay, some teachers are act were actually making more money than assistant principals because we hadn't made those adjustments. So that's another good example. Um, so we do recommend that in some way that you're attaching it to teacher salaries. Three, incorporate performance. Very important to consider. Consider demands of the principal's <coughs> assignments. That's where we talked about the demands. What are the demands on the assignment? I'm talking to some superintendents, they said, I may not want to pay a principal just because it's a bigger school. Other factors may be much more important for the demands of that school, and giving the superintendents the flexibility to do that and make those decisions is good. Align compensation with other priorities, especially since this is, we're talking about over $300 million of state money, tying this to other priorities, third grade liter literacy, the current plans for teacher leadership. What a great connection between the teacher leadership pipeline and the principal pipeline. So tying this in some way to other priorities, um, this is a great opportunity to do that. And last, again, because this is state money um, and you have an opportunity for them to provide guidance, those recommendations number three, four, and five, putting in place guardrails so that the districts both have the inspiration but also the requirement 